Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today to the virtual 49th National Adapted Physical Education Conference. My name is Heidi Erickson, and I am one of the four Butte County Office of Education specialists speaking today about the ripple of our impact. This is the story of how four APE specialists recognized a need in our community and figured out how to get things done. This story is not just about adaptive physical education or even physical education. It's about the community, well, our community, in which we live, we teach, and we are a part of. We want you to know that we were never afraid of an answer or a response. We weren't afraid to get our hands dirty and we were going to be part of an immediate solution to help our community heal. Our story is a process, a process that unfortunately continues. But let's start at one of the most tragic events that our community ever encountered. November 8, 2018, 8, 52, 13. was all too much. What were we really going to be doing? It was all so messy, so numbing, and looked impossible. Maybe, maybe it wasn't impossible. Maybe it just has to start somewhere. I'd like to introduce you to Mike O'Connor. Mike is a general physical education teacher up in Paradise, California. I've asked him to recall his story of that fateful day in November. I'd like to introduce one of my favorite teachers in all the world, Mike O'Connor. All right, good afternoon, Heidi. I'm a little hurt because you told me I was your favorite, not one of your favorites. Oh, that's so, true. You know, it kind of cuts me deep a little bit, just kidding. Um, I'm Mike O'Connor. I currently teach uh, middle school physical education at Paradise Junior Senior High School. 
which means we're on the high school campus right now. Um, that was where we landed up after um, the year of the campfire. So um, initially I was at Paradise Intermediate School the year of the fire. So, uh, that's me. I've been teaching physical education and some math along the way for uh, 24 years now. All right, so you uh, teach at the junior high, you were teaching at the junior high on that morning. Um, tell, can you tell me a little bit about that morning and what it was leading up to it? Sure, you know, it's one of those mornings that all of us have our own memory of certain things that we'll, we'll never forget, right? And I'll never forget my morning. I got in the car, um, driving up to school and, and leaving my house and just seeing the plume of smoke as mm -hmm. I was leaving East Avenue, getting on the freeway and I'm thinking, oh no, I forgot to get gas, you know, and I'm everything. I, I'm almost out of gas. I have enough to get to school for sure and back. But I'm like, as I'm driving up, I thought I don't, I don't have time to stop and get gas, which was stupid because <laughs> I knew it was going to end up that way. Anyway, turn up the skyway and just you get to see the plume coming, and I'm like, this, this isn't good. And I started, you know, snapping some pictures at red lights of, of what was in front of us, and uh, you know, it's just pretty eerie because I knew driving up that uh, this wasn't good. You know, in Paradise, we've had fires forever. It's always been a threat of fire danger. We've had, um, you know, close calls, you know, where we see it in the distance, you know, but it's never been that one. And it was that weird feeling driving up. And it, of course, as the day progressed, it, it was more and more, obviously, that it was that one. My initial uh, oh. statement to her, and we're pulling in the parking lot, and it wasn't just ash falling. I could, I'll just, I'll never forget it. It was the eeriest thing. You'd, you'd hear the ash clicking as it hit the ground, because it wasn't just ash. It was actually bits of embers um, falling. So at that point, it was a few minutes, we, we, we heard that we were one of the evacuation points that they were bringing other schools to our school. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this, this isn't going to go well. So um, Jess and I, we went down to the cafeteria. There was probably, I don't know, more than 100 kids for sure. And I'm like, hey, come on with us and we're going to clear out the cafeteria. We took the kids to the gym. And, uh, and I'm like, hey, let's, let's, just, let's just try and ease their concerns because obviously everybody was on edge and we got some basketballs out and like hey you can play knockout you can hang out this is all you know 45 minutes before school officially started kind mm. of a time frame uh, some radios on and now now it's it's clear that this point that uh evacuation is is on right and how is that happening um like everyone just kind of rose up and just took whatever role they they did they, they chose, I guess. And I was in, I distinctly remember, to the janitor's closet and they were on the phone making parent phone calls to try and get a hold of a line of like 15 kids trying to make calls. Um, there was people with walkie-talkies outside and then they'd radio me, hey, so-and-so's dad's here, saying, oh, hey, Billy, you know, your dad's here. And just trying to keep calm while we get kids in. And then, uh, yeah, so everyone just kind of rose up and, and I know the office was like printing out sheets, like we're signing off and highlighting who was, who was leaving and you know, I, I can't answer for what everybody else's role was, but everybody just kind of stepped up in whatever way they could because it was, it was clear that game was on. And, so uh, and then it was also like, I remember we uh, separated like, hey, if you have siblings, if they were pairs, there was a walkie-talkie, hey, send the pairs to the cafeteria mm -hmm. so that we can have brothers and sisters or brothers together, right, to get them out. So it was, it was kind of goofy. No, kind of goofy. Okay. It was really goofy. Yeah. And um some, some kids like, are, are we going to be okay? Is, are we going to, you know, some kids are like, we're going to die. You know, some kids, they don't know what to do, right? And they just say the off-the-cuff things, and, and maybe they're right. Like, this, this could be beyond mm -hmm. crazy bad. So, again, we just tried to reassure them, like, hey, we're, we're, uh, we're calm. We're get, we'll get you out of here. So, uh, the, through the day, there was these moments, though. It was like three for me, where I distinctly remember thinking, hmm, why did I come to work today? Like, this, this, this could be it for me. Right? I was like, am I going to die today? You know, that we were like, okay, got dismissed that, right? But it's like, here we are at school and you, you just do what you need to do. Um, driving up was that one first weird feeling. Then you get there, you're like, this is serious, weird feeling. And then at one point, I'll never forget this, this dad came in and uh, he was picking up his son. And so the whole time, I've never looked behind me, right? I'm just looking at the gym, supervising kids, and I got the microphone, hey, Billy, hey, Susie, whatever. And this dad comes in, I'm like, hey, how's it going out there? Just trying to get his finger on the pulse. And he's very calm, you could tell. I know he wasn't, he was probably upside down with his emotions, but he, I remember him leaning in and he said, uh, traffic is a nightmare. I'm starting to hear explosions. And I went, oh, okay. And I thought, oh, what's that all about? And it turns out it was propane tanks that were just exploding, right? I didn't know that at the time. 
here comes this kid. And I remember very calmly the dad who's like six foot three and his kid who's, you know, four foot nothing. He leans over and he's like, okay, you're going to see it right with me. We're going to be okay. He was very calm. We're going to go out to the car. He said, I want to prepare you. It's very dark outside. Right. And I was like, oh, I hadn't seen this yet. Anyway, we whittled our way down to the last uh, probably 40 kids. And I remember them calling us on the radio, like we're gonna get all the kids in the cafeteria now, which is a hundred yard walk, right? And I remember, hey, everyone get your cell phones out and let's, uh, let's go like, uh, like I said, let's go like Harry Potter and let's get our little lights on our little wands. And so we walked up with our little, with our flashlights on our phones and we walked up to the cafeteria. It was really that dark? Oh, Heidi, it, it black as night, okay. blacker than night Wow. at nine o'clock. So, and you know, we're all trying to just do our own job. Now we're just smelling the smoke and, and we're in the cafeteria. Next moment, I get the heebie-jeebie. My friend Greg, who's a, a teacher at school and he's also a Durham volunteer, volunteer firefighter. I remember him walking in, our principal was there and he was saying, okay, I, th I think we'll be okay here. If we can't get out, I think we'll be, we'll be okay in, in this facility. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, like we're not leaving. And, you know, if like, if we don't get everybody out, and fire overcomes us, this is where we're gonna be okay. And he goes, and if, if this building gets compromised, we'll exit out to the field and we'll just lay down in the field. And I'm going, holy smokes, this, this, is not, uh, this is not good, right? You know, then, then I think our counselor came in, I heard her say, okay, um, the, the police, they're telling us it's time to go. Like we're supposed to go, we're supposed to take kids in, in, in cars. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know I was in charge of this, right? Yeah. I, I want somebody with a higher pay grade to say, <laughs> No problem, take five kids and go through a, a burning inferno and, and have at it, right? Oroville police officer, I'll never forget, it. he comes in. It turns out it's a friend of my wife's husband, who, you know, I have no idea who this person is, but he comes in and he, he yells to get everyone's attention and no one does it and he, or he whistles or something. And then he was just like, it was, you, you could tell it was on. I think it was, shut up. And it was like, and he's like, Seatbelt laws do not apply. Mm -hmm. You are leaving right now. Everybody's going to get inside somebody's car and you are leaving right. I'm like, okay, I can follow that direction. I'm like, who's got however many seats? And everyone's going, I got three, I got four, I got, you know, and everyone's, they just, everyone's grabbing kids and they're, they're working their way out. I already prearranged. I was going with my friend. All just crazy, nutty stuff. Um, did you, did you realize the extent of the fire when you were driving away then? You know, when I, I remember saying to, to Linda when we were driving, I said, I said, Linda, I said, thousands of people are going to die today. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was, I had no question. I'm like, as fast as that fire moved, right? For me rolling at school, it was like 743, right? And by 10 o'clock when we left, and it took forever to get the, it was 10 o'clock when we finally left. Mm -hmm. um, it took forever to get everyone out and just to know how fast that fire was moving, how dark it was and knowing the exit routes that we have in paradise and the log jams. And I'm like, there's, there's no way that all these people are going to get out. And um, I forget the actual numbers, 87 or, or something people that actually perished in the fire, which is absolutely tragic at the same time. What a miracle in my mind, as far as um, what that number certainly could have been. Cause I, I thought for sure thousands and thousands of people were going to perish. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, I'm glad you were wrong, but yeah, you definitely too. had the right idea. So is it my understanding that during the campfire, no students that were in schools perished? That's true. Not a single one. That's amazing. Um, you know, one of the highest ups in Cal Fire, him telling me the time frame of things. So like when we were in that cafeteria, like the bus barn, which is just what, 300 yards from us. I mean, it was burning in the elementary school. It was, it was on fire engulfed in flame, like I couldn't even see it. It's, it's just over the fence, but it was so dark. Uh, we didn't even see that, but it was, those structures were burning while we were still, you know, getting out of the, out of the building. So yeah, it was, it was beyond close. Wow. And uh, it, and it, it's amazing that, that not a single student mm -hmm. was lost. And that's something I, don't, I, I like thinking about it because I'm proud of that fact, but I don't like to go down that road because it's a, a mm -hmm. quick rabbit hole where you know, you can go other places emotionally. Right, right. And I, I appreciate you telling your story because I think it's incredibly important for us to realize. So how do you think your decisions on that day really impacted your students? Uh, well, uh, not just me, all, all of us, every, every decision that everybody made. Um, there, there were some decisions that sometimes people had to be extra. So my colleagues like had to be like, 
straight up with the kid, you're not going anywhere. Cause there were some kids like, oh, I'm out of here. You know, like, no, you're not right. Cause some kids want to like, I'm leaving today. It doesn't get to be, I'm defiant today or whatever. This, I distinctly remember too, we, we have a virtue of the week each week and that week it happened to be service. And I remember saying that in the cafeteria, I'm like, Hey, this week is service and you know, we're going to take care of each other today. And uh, little did I know quite how far that was going to go. But, um, yeah, and in fact, I, I'll never forget too. That was that, that Monday when we introduced service, you know, the, the challenge I had for the kids is like, Hey, who did you help today? I only think of one person, you went out of your way to kind of help. So if everybody helps everybody, just think how awesome that would be. And so it was kind of weird and eerie how that ended up being our message for the week, because if people didn't step up and help your neighbor and, and the whole community stepped up and we all know what an amazing way that was, but. So how were the students was, reunited with their parents? Cause I would imagine you had some that didn't know, or were you part of that at all? No, certainly I was. Um, obviously there was the kids getting on the cars and leaving and there was the kids getting in the bus. Right. And then we all reconvened at the fairgrounds in Chico. Right. And so I didn't get to the fairgrounds until we left at 10, came down Neil, got backed up halfway down Neil. Um, I'll never forget hitting highway 99. Finally, when we got there through the traffic and turning, and here's my next door neighbor. He's been my neighbor for years. He's a deputy with Butte County Sheriff and he's, he's waving the traffic on. And I remember seeing him just looking up and just weeping. Right. And I'm like, Oh, it breaks my heart just to see that. Cause you know, he knows exactly what's happened. So, uh, excuse me. So, you know, we get back to the fairgrounds and, and here's all these kids at this point. Gosh, mm, I don't know. hundred kids. I'm guessing I, I, don't, I don't have the number, but there was a lot. Right. And we had these hundred kids and then parents, we had, you know, we had them back in the, in the fairground area and parents had to show up to the first gate and make sure that they got checked in and radios and walk your kid to your parent. And, and you know, those emotional moment, moments of having people uh, reconvene. Then we were told we had to leave the fairgrounds. We were probably there an hour, maybe two. I don't know. Time's kind of a blur, <laughs> but we had to move because it was now going to be incident command for a Cal Fire, right? So like now they moved us to the Mormon church on East Avenue. Okay, back on the bus we go. And now we're down to there's two buses, I remember, uh, uh, 50 kids. I'm making up numbers here, but something like that. So we go to the um, to the church there. And it's again, here's our new protocol. And everyone's stepping up. And one, one teacher's like, okay, I'll be the sign-off person. I'm like, have at it, man. That's the job I don't want right now. I'm just amazed. So as the as we suffered through the campfire, there came a point where we had to get back to a new norm. What did that look like? When did you guys decide that we got to get our kids back and where did you go? What did you do? What did that look like? Yeah, it's, it's continuing to be what does it look like, right? We just continue to morph uh, that new reality of what is our new normal. Um, you know, initially, I think it was three weeks before we finally went back to school, like uh, after Thanksgiving break. And it was, I think, well, gosh, it's November 8th. So yeah, from that moment through Thanksgiving, maybe the week after, I can't remember, but I think it was three weeks before Christmas and we ended up landing at the mall um, in the old, uh, I think, uh, lens crafters. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. The lens crafters room right there at the left edge, well, whatever, at the mall. And uh, at that point it was, you know, Chromebook and check in and what a crazy thing that was just seeing families and how many people are going to show up and here's your Chromebook in the parking lot that people donated and, and all the legal stuff. It's like, well, you can't come in because then it's school property. If it's out there, we can give it to you. All these weird oh. things, you know, it was nuts. But stop at that point was mainly just trying to call families. Mm -hmm. We were just calling. Where are you? Are you okay? We're in Nevada. We're in Idaho. We're in the Bay Area. We're everywhere, right? We're living in a trailer. We're, we're at our so-and-so's house in Chico. Just across the gamut, as you can only imagine. So we were just kind of doing data and trying to find people. Um, and then, you know, that was the big crunch. We're coming to, to winter break, Christmas break, and again, not knowing where we're going to be. We had, everyone else had a location. The high school found the fortress out by the airport. I didn't say that right. Ponderosa was at Durham. They shared yes, their yeah, campus. Yeah. Durham yeah. shared their campus. Oroville shared theirs for Paradise Elementary. Right. So we were just all over the place. And so the intermediate school, we were the last ones to kind of find a home. And uh, it wasn't until, I don't think it was even secured except during Christmas break, where we finally got the abandoned orchard supply hardware, the OSH building, which we affectionately uh, named my colleague, Pat, called it Posh, <laughs> whose paradise <laughs> at OSH was Posh. So we, we affectionately <laughs> had Posh as our new home. And we landed there and then um, 
Christy Mullen was fantastic. And I think it was her idea. She's one of my two colleagues at the time at the intermediate school. So um, Christy said, hey, let's reach out to the, to the card, folks at card and see if they can let us use the field house. And they were just phenomenal there. And they let us use the card field house gym Tuesdays and Thursdays, if my memory serves, right? And so Tuesdays, we end up taking seventh graders on field trips on the bus. And then Thursdays was eighth grade. And, and what, a, what a huge thing that was for not just kids in PE to get out and get time to actually play, but for the rest of the warehouse, because it was just an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you talk about being creative. That, that team at Osh, we were unbelievable what people had to come up with to, to make school function. Um, it was nuts, but we made it through. And it's one of those weird things. It's, it's almost like a fond memory now. Like, remember that Osh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> remember really. teaching at a hardware store? <laughs> It's, it's crazy. So I, I noticed in some of our pictures um, that I put on our slideshow that we're going to view today, you do have equipment. How did that come about? Yeah. Uh, well, you guys were great. Heidi, you and uh, Cami Anderson and Gina McKellar. Am I forgetting somebody else from? McKenzie. McKenzie. Yeah. McKenzie from, from BCOE. The APE crew was just phenomenal. I think it was our, I think maybe it was our first day at the field house. We walked in, we had some equipment. I don't even know what we had or how we had it. I don't remember, to be honest. And you folks, maybe you guys probably brought it to us. I don't know. And you're like, hey, we can get you equipment. What do you guys need? And we're like, oh gosh, let's get some gator skins. And how about some, uh, we need some cones. And we need, we, like, what are the essentials? Like we can just play and get kids to, to have moments of escape to just be kids. Because mm -hmm. right now they've lost everything, right? They've lost their home. They might've lost a pet. They've lost where they're living. They're, they're, the shoes they're wearing and the shirt on the back is probably the only thing they've got except whatever somebody gave to them, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys were truly instrumental in that. Um, we reached out to uh, U-Haul. Remember calling U-Haul? We're like, hey, uh, you guys happen to have a trailer we can borrow? I'm like, I'm Mike O'Connor from Paradise Intermediate School. And the guy's like, oh, intermediate school? Yeah, no problem. What do you need? I'm like, <laughs> uh, you got like a six by eight or whatever size trailer we can use on all our P equipment? No problem. Eventually got a lot of equipment. I, we have some pictures of you playing ping pong in the, um, yes. the garden center. So yes. where, did you, where did you get those donations of the ping pong tables? Yeah, so again, you guys were stuffed. The, the U-Haul trailer, the North Valley Community Foundation, I know okay. we reached out to them and they gave us a, a large grant of money for things. There was so much money pouring in from, I don't even remember who donated what or what gave us money to, the purse strings kind of got loose on what we needed for things. And so we bought ping pong tables, um, which were awesome, right? We still have them now. I've got, I'm teaching a ping pong unit last year, which was great. Yeah. Ping pong pitching machine, the thing I wanted to buy for years. But I'm like, when am I ever going to be able to do that? Well, <laughs> you know, you got to find the silver lining. So we found some of them. Um, yeah, so. So how long were you at Posh? So we finished the school year. Um, so the whole second semester was at Posh. And then, yeah, then it was the mad dash. Like, where are we going to be? because uh, intermediate school they decided now is going to be um, Ponderosa Elementary which campus is mostly still there they lost some structures but not the whole campus. Did and you Paradise, lose your campus up at Paradise no, Intermediate? No um, Paradise Elementary was leveled so those two elementary schools went to the intermediate school we did lose the top wing of our sixth grade wing so the sixth grade portables mm -hmm. right by Pearson and the Gold Nugget Museum right all that was wiped out um, so that's where they're currently living. It's now Paradise Ridge Elementary. And then the intermediate school, we are at the high school. We're now Paradise Junior Senior High School as of last year and then this school year. Wow. And that's just one natural disaster that happened in our recent years. Now we have, obviously we have the COVID-19. Uh, COVID right. And is Paradise affected by any of the late, the fires of late or what, is, what does it look like up in Paradise? <sighs> So obviously, uh, March 16th, 17th, whatever, everything shut down like everyone's doing. Um, Google Classroom, all, all that kind of stuff last spring. This, this fall, we start all Zoom distance learning. Just this, today's Tuesday. Yesterday was my first day in person with students. We started our mm -hmm. hybrid model. So half the kids are on campus um, every other day. Fridays, everybody Zooms, nobody comes to campus. That's our hybrid schedule. Um, yeah. Just the other, we're up to nine school days so far that we have not been in school because of power shut off or, or fire evacuations or um, 
yeah, those are the, those are the big two. We came back from Labor Day and then the uh, Bear Fire, which turned into the mm -hmm. North Complex, right? I mean, that was threatening paradise and it was like people were asked to evacuate and, you know, the three day weekend ended up turning out to be an entire week that we didn't go to school. So we're up to, I think it was two power shutoff days before that, those four days. Then we had two more, whatever. I think it's up to nine now, wow. which is just unreal to go October in nine school days. So our poor kids have not had um, the education they deserve this last few years um, to nobody's fault, but just the situation that it is. So it's gonna be a long haul for us to recover. Um, and then some things never will recover all the way, right? There's some things that you'll, you'll never get back. What okay. advice could you give teachers and anyone listening? Um, I guess this fact, and it's truly a fact, you will never know the impact you have on people. You just won't. Occasionally, you'll get those little glimpses. I find myself to be incredibly blessed and fortunate to, um, since the fire, you know, it puts people in a whole different emotional state, right? And when people are in a different emotional state, things come out that wouldn't normally come out. Um, this last, uh, it's one of my favorite stories this last spring. Um, it's been my tradition for as long as I've been doing this that, in fact, I think I stole this. If Sam Simmons is out there, good old Sam Simmons from Chico <laughs> High School, I never had you, Sam. I was a lowly student teacher coming to do my, my credential observations and it was a Friday and Sam Simmons like, hey everybody, it's Friday. And everyone's like, think before you act. And I'm like, that's cool. That was his Friday send off. So I stole it like any good teacher, you just steal something, right? So that's been my Friday send off for the last 24 years. It's like, hey kids, you know, we have our weekend coming up. We should always think before you act, but let's just be smart. I hate that when we roll in on Monday and there's that, that emergency meeting, like something terrible happened to somebody because they made a, they made a bad choice. So that's our Friday send off every Friday. It's Friday and the kids y'all think before you act as loud as they can, right? You think before you act, I'm saying it to myself. And as I sign off, this is just this last spring, like in May, I'm going, this is stupid, right? I'm like, is this make any difference? This is just, I feel like this is just lip service. I'm just saying this because it sounds good. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't even know. And so I had this, this, this lack of self-confidence, if you will, that the things that I, that you used to work forever, right? It's like, I don't know if it even applies anymore. Me and your other former student who was on your basketball team, we're married now. We live in Montana and uh, we, our family had to leave after the fire, blah, blah, blah. But we were just thinking, hey, it's Friday, think before you act. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I messaged her back. I'm like, she's like, is it okay if we, if we Facebook you? I'm like, are you kidding? You just made my day. Like you just, this is like the coolest thing you ever could have said to me because, right? Like, I, I mean, I, no joke. It was that, like, it was, it was a sign from God, right? 2002, right? That I had this wow. 18, 18 years ago. Wow. And they send this Facebook message like, hey, it's Friday, think before you act. So uh, that's the coolest you round, thing. You rounded up my whole interview by saying a ripple effect in the impact. You said this in 2002 two, and we're in 2020 yep. and your students are still feeling the impact of your rip, ripples right. way back then. Right. That, that sounds oh. way too complimentary, but, but yeah, we just yes. don't know these little messages that, that we send to kids with, you know, and it's, 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 it's like fertilizer, you throw it out there, some of it takes, some of it doesn't, you know, some of it burns the grass and it is what it is. But for the most, you know, things are growing, right? And that's why I said, most of us will probably never know. You'll never know. Because most people won't step out to say those things because they're not in that crazy different emotional place that makes it feel more natural to say it, to reach out and go, hey, thank you. Or, hey, hey, this mattered or whatever. But right, right. right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today. Much more so, yeah. I appreciate you taking the initiative to get kids off the hill that day and make sure that they were all safe. It was a pleasure helping you get, find the equipment and be part of the equipment to get kids back to a normalization. But more than anything, I just want to say thank you. You're very welcome. Heidi, thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks all for all right. of you out there and have a good rest of your day. As you can tell, Mike O'Connor is a fantastic teacher. One of my favorites to this day. 
Tim Taylor is also another favorite person of mine. During the campfire, Tim Taylor was the Butte County Office of Education Superintendent of Schools. He played a large part in our decision making on that day. Mike said, when you reach out, there is likely a hand to help you, but you have to ask first. Maybe you even need to be willing to accept the help. Maybe someone will need to depend on you. I'd like to share this short clip that came from Mr. Tim Taylor. Um, it's a little, he doesn't speak clearly in the very beginning, so I hope you can understand it, but this is what he has to say. When I heard that the adaptive PE team at Butte County was uh, selected to be the keynote speaker, I really teared up and was super chilled because I know what great things they've done for kids over the years. And um, as we have looked at the campfire situation, you can imagine what happened to us. We had 5,000 students became homeless. We had 18,000 structures that were burned down. 25,000 people were evacuated instantly. And we also lost 82 lives. So as the kids started to come back to school, it was my responsibility to look at how we could help them heal. And we obviously brought in a lot of counseling, but I had to turn to people that I really trusted that had great relationships with our most vulnerable kids. And they uh, had good relationships with the families, the schools, the teachers. And I turned to the BCOE adaptive team knowing that they were the ones. And they went on these campuses and did their thing. And they created the ripple effect that we hear that is really what your conference is about. They created the momentum to say we got this and physical activity is the cure for mental health along with I believe the arts, the visual and performing arts. Today we're in this major pandemic and again I'm watching great physical education teachers keep kids healthy and balanced and those that don't have that commitment the kids are really suffering with their anxiety and mental health. I know what work all you guys do as adaptive PE uh, teachers, you guys are angels. And I would hope that you keep committed. The way, we, the way we can help kids with trauma, anxiety, and issues is physical fitness, physical education, and that's what you do well. So on behalf of everyone that works in the education, I wanna say two things. Adaptive PE strong and heart BCOE adaptive PE team. Love you guys, take care. Okay, well, we definitely need to work on his ability to say adapted rather than adapted, but that's what we're dealing with. All right, I'd like to finish up with, not finish, I'd like to continue on with our slideshow. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what it looked like for us at this point. We realized after the campfire that we needed to purchase a lot of equipment. At first, we were given permission to use our own budget to get that equipment out immediately. I think that's what Mike said that we originally started with. We were already volunteering in different capacities, but when we were given the green light, we went right into action. McKinsey took the lead and we began doing needs assessment for recess equipment for all the affected schools. Round one was going to be recess equipment. Round two would be the physical education equipment. We would work with a school, get a list, write it up and give it to McKenzie, and she would be on the phone with Gopher to get the equipment ordered. Within a week or two, large boxes of equipment flooded our office. McKenzie would inventory it. We would write the name of the school initials on every piece of equipment, pump it up if needed, and organize it into sports bags and ball carts. We purchased and put together basketball standards, those ball carts and soccer goals for those schools, which were now located on church campuses or inside old stores. We did our best to get the equipment out as fast as we could. For weeks, McKinsey worked with Gopher Sports and ordered a lot of equipment. There were days that Cammie would pack up her car and deliver equipment out to Mike at the U-Haul trailer. There were other times that the crew would stop by and grab the equipment that we had just gotten in and just labeled. It would be the same day that we got it. We delivered recess equipment to Ponderosa Elementary School. 
These were where students from Ponderosa Elementary School were housed. They were now on the Durham campus. We delivered recess equipment to Concow Elementary School, which was on the Spring Valley campus. We delivered recess equipment and modified physical education equipment to the functional life skills classes that were now located on the fairgrounds. We also went to the mall, to the Lens Crafter store, and located Annie Jank. She was the Paradise High School athletic director. We wanted to see how we could support the high school students and the PHS physical education teachers. Paradise High eventually moved out of the airport, out to the airport to an empty warehouse where they resumed class. Paradise Intermediate was moved to the empty Orchard Supply hardware store. Mike, Christie, and Jessica transformed an old, dirty, empty Orchard Supply building store into posh. They moved around racks, dividers, empty shelving, and more to create a safe, positive learning space for all Paradise Intermediate school teachers and students. The former garden area became an outdoor PE space so that students could still participate in quality physical education. After a strong power washing, this is where Mike put the ping pong tables that were purchased with money donated by North Valley Community Foundation. We were asked to put together an impromptu basketball team and we were invited to attend High Hoops, which was located in Red Bluff. They were hosting a basketball tournament and we were invited. We were also able to take some of our adopted PE students skiing up to Mount Shasta just to get away. We would be remiss if we didn't recognize our fearless leader, Sheriff Corey Honey. Sheriff Honey was a clear example of leadership during this time. He had such a strong presence and impact on our community and caused millions of ripples. When thanked, Sheriff Honey always said it was his duty and his pleasure to serve this community. He is the ultimate example of leadership and call to action. If you actually Google it, there are hundreds of memes creating his, his extolation and his leadership. Sierra Nevada Brewery also brewed a special beer named Honey Honey after him, and it, it was pretty good. There were other forces in our community that came forward to help. Mike talked about the North Valley Community Foundation. They set up some funding sources and collected monetary donations that was used across the community. The, they continue to be a source of ripples in our community with all of the disaster relief resources for those affected by natural disasters in our own community. And boy, we have had plenty. Go for sports, they were amazing. McKenzie worked closely with Gopher and thousands of dollars were spent on physical education and physical activity equipment for our schools. We also wanna recognize Chico Area Rec Department. They opened up the field house on 20th Street so that Mike, Christie, and Jessica had a safe place to bring students together for physical education. Butte County and the surrounding trauma response teams provided much needed counseling for staff, students, and families. It was evident that thousands of our own community people were now homeless, displaced, emotionally scarred, and traumatized. BCOE set up volunteer booths at the FEMA headquarters. We tried to locate our families and discussed possible school options. They were now displaced, homeless students, and we had to answer a lot of questions about schools reopening. We passed out backpacks that had been stuffed with school supplies and toiletries for our students. These came from students and schools from the surrounding communities. This was an important day because as county APE teachers, we served these affected areas and we knew many of the students with and without disabilities. Many times you would see a student and their family walk up and they were grateful to see a familiar face. We listened to each person's story. A lot of hugs were shed and a lot of tears and a lot of tears were shed and also a lot of hugs. In February, 2017, a year and a half before the campfire, 
188,000 people were evacuated from the towns of Gridley, Oroville, Thermalito, Durham, and Palermo as the spillway to Lake Oroville Dam had been compromised. Sheriff Coney, Sherry, Sheriff Corey Pony declared an emergency and issued mandatory evacuations in several communities below the dam. Families were ordered to leave their homes immediately and many headed to higher ground or to friends homes or extended family homes. Some of them even to evacuation shelters in safer places. During this time, we had the task of contacting all of our students and families to make sure that they were evacuated and in a safe place. Many of our students and their families landed at Red Cross shelters at the Silver Dollar Fairgrounds in Chico. As an adaptive PE team, we gathered expendable equipment such as puzzles, games, playing cards, bubbles, chalk, playground balls, basketballs, coloring books, crayons, and markers. And we even designed some activities that we could teach at the fairgrounds. We were actually able to locate many of our students and their families at the evacuation centers around town. There were evacuation centers at the fairgrounds, churches, and community centers. We did our best to reach out to every single one. Because we are a county office of education, we have a unique perspective on how outreach can be done. We aren't just an entity within a school district. We have the ability to be part of many different districts and serve all students in many different schools. And then in the middle of March, 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Like all of you, our normal way of life and the typical school day ceased to exist. We all became teachers of online teaching and had to learn about technology. We gathered resources for parents. Who are we kidding? They now were the new teachers. We had to develop a new way to teach adaptive physical education remotely and prepare for the next steps. We all attended many trainings, workshops, and webinars on learning different platforms so that we could reach our students in the many different districts. Of course, all of them used a different platform. We learned about Seesaw, Google Meet, Zoom, and any other platform acronym that you could think of. We learned how to make videos and upload, download, render, publish, whatever we had to do to get them out to our students. And obviously some of us are still learning because I'm doing a decent job at this, but it's obviously a little bit harder to do. We continue to gather and provide resources for students, families, and teachers based on their needs. CAMI created a collaborative virtual classroom that linked our, all of our individual virtual classrooms specific to the needs of our own students. We also became part of the Bimoji craze. Our BCOE IT department was able to have our county email addresses whitelisted to the districts that we serve so that we could access the Google Classrooms and connect with students. We reached out to our Greater Northern California AP Consortium members, and we were able to gather and share Google Docs and resources across Northern California. We also met with other AP teachers in our own county to support and provide consistent quality adaptive physical education resources to all of the students and families in our area. Like many of you, we updated our virtual classrooms, spent endless hours on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube, collecting more and more resources and become Bitmoji craze experts. Not sure why that just popped up, but hey, that worked out good. In August of 2020, the Bear Fire became the North Complex West Zone Fire, and many teachers, school staff, and students and their families were evacuated once again. During the North Complex Fire, we lost an additional two elementary schools. Feather Falls and Berry Creek were totaled. Once again, this affected many of our students, staff, families, and our schools. They were once again scarred, scared, and traumatized. 
our mental health resources were once again in full swing. We are now more aware of weather, smoke, sirens, and each other, and helping our communities. In the aftermath of fires, many of our schools and communities are still affected by PSPS, or power safety, power shutoffs. The power is cut off for days to protect communities from the risk of another fire. But this also means that the electricity and the internet is cut off, preventing students and teachers from accessing online learning. We are a resilient group of adapted PE teachers. We are in our community. We are our community. We aren't afraid of the word no. We work on it being a yes. We aren't afraid to get our hands dirty. We'll make it happen. Don't be afraid to jump in and cause a ripple. That is really how you get things done. How do you create your own ripple in the field to be impactful for students, for parents, and for your community? You're gonna have to do the footwork. Reach out to your colleagues. No idea is a bad idea. Use what you have. Find it if you don't. Get your hands dirty. Oh yeah, and some of our ripples are on the smaller side. We are infamous for our school pictures, as you can see. Don't be afraid of creating a big ripple or a small ripple. Each size, no matter what, eventually has an impact. That's how you get things done. Take a moment, think about your ripples and what impact they have had on students. What future ripples do you see? How do decisions that you make impact your students? How do your decisions impact your community? Start asking questions. Don't worry about even if the answer is no. Find a different way of asking these questions. My name is Dr. Heidi C. Erickson, and I am an adapted physical education specialist for Butte County Office of Education. On behalf of Cami Anderson, Gina McKellar, and Mackenzie Breckenridge, my fellow BCOE AP specialist, we want to thank you for spending your morning with us and hope you have a wonderful conference. We can't wait to hear about your ripples and impacts on students in your community. Now we'd like to say, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. Any comments? Go ahead. We can handle it. And like Mike said, every Friday, take a moment and just say to yourself and to your students, think before you act. Thank you so much for today, and I look forward to chatting with you.